close for getting there. Well, hey guys, welcome. Hey. I'm excited to have Mark Brand and Robert Eggers on the call today. Um, we were just having a fun pre pre conference chat in the green room. Uh, I just want to do my best uh, uh, pod NPR warning for podcast listeners. There is no unbeat version of this of this. So if you have kids, put the earmuffs on. We're gonna have a great kind of conversation. So let's introduce you guys, Robert. Why don't you tell folks a little bit about what you do? Uh, well, I started the DC Central Kitchen in 1988. Uh, I think. Um, one of the very first community kitchens uh, in the country that takes food that would have been thrown away from restaurants, hotels, trained unemployed men and women for jobs and produced, uh, you know, at this point, I think 50 million meals the kitchen has been up to. I've worked with Jose Andreas in World Central Kitchen since it founded, uh, but also early social entrepreneur, very interested in how do we escape the the kind of nonprofit for profit split and, and come up with a hybrid, which I think many in the audience are interested in. But that's my that's what I do. All right. I want to explore some of that kind of out of the box hybrid thinking. Uh, Mark, also, I think you do a little bit of that yourself. You're already kind of doing some of that right now in real time. But introduce yourself real quick. Yeah. So I run that hybrid. So we created the hybrid model about nine or 10 years ago. We were the first B Corp restaurant here in Canada. Um, I also run a B Corp uh, brewery, 11 acre farm uh, in this, on the Sunshine Coast and a charity and foundation called the Better Life Foundation in both Canada and the US. And um, as of this year, uh, Mexico as well. And the Better Life Foundation's mandate is to feed, train, and employ, uh, but also to educate and to advocate for food systems and the people in them, which is hundreds of millions. So that's that's our job. And my job outside of that is I'm a professor of innovation. So I teach design thinking and innovation and try and use that around social justice mandates, uh, as well as a, a speaker and a cook. So I run around the country and cook with folks like Sarah, who's a dear, dear friend, and how we know each other. Um, on stuff like food waste, but also on poverty and uh, equality. Just pulled the professor. I didn't even know you're a professor. Just like, hey, I'm a professor as well. You just drop that. That's awesome. You're one of those guys that does lots of things. Um, and that's why I think you've been able to pivot quickly. We had a conversation, I think, about a week ago, Mark, and you talked about like before any other restaurants, your peer group, you were basically talking uh, with your landlords, you were talking with your employees, you knew that you were going to shut down before like the government was telling you to shut down. Talk about those first weeks as they rolled on and how you thought about things in your business. Sure. I think the, you know, and I don't want to be um, all sunshine here, but there's a tremendous opportunity to reevaluate the restaurant structure and to how we're doing. At our very best, we're a 15% business, right? So when anybody is like, I want to open a restaurant, first I say don't. And then second, <laughs> I say, if you think it's a good idea, if you are the best in the business, you're making 15 points. And so just thinking about that as a metric, right? If you're selling something for $25, what's 15% of it? Is that worth it and what you carry? So you have to love what you do. And because we do, we're really connected to all of our relationships. Our landlords are also our friends. Um, otherwise, don't take them as a landlord because you know what, that's, what that entails. So what are the intrinsic relationships between suppliers, between everybody, government, uh, et cetera. And so I had been in Thailand working with their government for a couple of weeks and had sort of seen the beginning of this thing uh, and popped through on my way home to Los Angeles and saw what was happening. And it, it was it was this really stark contrast of denial. And I was like, oh no, everything's fine. That's a, that's a problem for over there. And I was like, no, this is a global issue and we have to get ahead. So I got back to Canada thinking, you know, that we stay pretty far ahead of this stuff and we were nowhere near it. So just prepped my staff, prepped my partners, and then sent some preemptive uh, emails to my landlords to say, hey, guys, we're going to need an abatement, not a deferral, an abatement. Like, we're not going to be able to pay this. You kick it down the road and put us further in debt. That's not helpful to anybody. Um, an abatement. And then when we reopen, we're going to need a further abatement to get back on our feet and generate some revenue. And they were like, because of this flu? I'm like, no, no, not because of the flu. Uh, and so it, but some were delayed in response. And when they did get back, they're like, okay, well, let's look at this at a month by month basis and really open to it because of our long term relationships. What I always say to people when helping them in these sort of situations is you have to ask and you have to be really honest about what's going to happen because I think folks think we have more money than we do as restaurateurs and we, we just don't have any money. That's just not a thing. So we got ahead of it and then working with my staff, which is the number one priority for us too, right? Of 
if you're going to be laid off, how do we look after you in that time? Setting up food pantries in our kitchens to make sure that people have access to quality food during this and making sure that they still have their full medical, dental, um, and mental health uh, coverage, which we started doing in 08. So just looking at the whole ecosystem is yeah. really important. You know, um, one of the things um, that also happened early on and it's still happening is the food system just froze. There's tons of food in process, in, in, in flow, and the, the large aggregators and the restaurants had foods in their fridge or they're in trucks. And it, it just led to a massive amount of food waste. We talked a little bit about it with Sarah. I know that people were talking about it in the first session. Robert, this is something you've been focused on for a big part of your career. Uh, talk a little bit about your thinking as you kind of evaluated what's happening here. Well, you know, what's wild, man, is, um, you know, there's a whole network uh, all around the world now of programs that recycle food that's donated. Uh, and, and they had a windfall. And of course, they uh, hopefully many of them had uh, the storage capacity. I mean, you know, many of the programs, the first gen, picked up and dropped off. And what you know, what I think uh, Mark and I and many tried to introduce is the the idea of the kitchen in the middle, where you can make heads or tails of all this stuff. So there was an initial kind of flood of food into the system. And what you're seeing now, you know, Mark mentioned some of the travails of the for-profit side or the restaurant side. What you're seeing also is the nonprofit side, because again, so many of the restaurants that are so generous, not just with food, but with fundraising, all those fundraisers are gone. And so what you have is a nonprofit sector that is really hamstrung at the very moment that um, you have an enormous amount of people and growing every day coming and seeking support. So for example, I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm working with obviously Jose and World Central Kitchen. I'm working with the Fair Wage Coalition in some efforts to get restaurants and government lined up in San Francisco, LA and New York. But now I'm here on the ground in, in New Mexico. And going back to your original thing is, uh, uh, I think we have to realize that from the restaurant perspective, that's pretty much shut down. In fact, David Chang put out a, a tweet this morning saying, you know, restaurants can't survive and carry out. That just, so one of the things that interests me is A, government I think is gonna have to start buying food. There's just no way around that. Local, state, federal government, they gotta buy food. And what I'm talking about primarily is the growers. You know, what's interesting is this is beginning right at the very beginning of the growing season. Obviously, California is a 24-7, uh, uh, but in many states now, you're beginning to see the farmer's markets open up. Many farmer's markets are trying to stay open and keep their customers safe. They're switching to CSA boxes for those who can afford it. But for those of us who really are focusing down further, much further down the food chain, we're really trying to say, okay, look, we have a magic moment here we can actually start to get much more local food into the food system that was historically um, uh, uh, kind of filled with processed food. You know, again, the charitable sector, we got what was pushed down the system. And to a certain extent, and I say this with love in my heart, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of culpability because for 30, 40 years, we've been pushing processed food down to poor people. And there is a certain level of responsibility we have for the obesity and diabetes epidemic amongst the poor. Huge moment here. Um, but I'm going to touch in one more thing before we kind of move on. Um, while I'm talking about buying food, throughout the food system in America, when you really get into outside of restaurants, when you get into institutional foods, prisons, schools, meals on wheels, even the military, every single contract, every single contract is usually based on low bid. Which food company can, can sell it to us the cheapest? And low bid has historically been where low wage, exported profit, healthcare ramifications, and ultimately the need for charity arises. What many of us are looking now is for this moment to start to introduce more local food into the system, but help local government realize that low bid should be replaced by best value. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's a whole new way of looking about how to spend taxpayer money. And I think what we can highlight now is this magic moment where an intelligent mayor can say to his, his or her constituents, I had to spend money and we probably didn't have it, but I had to do it. But I did it. I supported the local farmers first. I kept them solvent because they're the they're the bedrock of our food system. And I, if they freeze up, woe unto all of us. So we kept that. But we also hired a bunch of local restaurant people who were out of work to come into a central hub facility and help us process this food into beautiful, balanced meals. So, again, I think what we can look at now is is hopefully take um, many legislators who looked at many of us when we came to talk about local foods and rolled their eyes and thought this was a Berkeley dream, you know, or a hippie dream come true. Now I think we have the potential to make it a reality and they can see the economic ripple 
that flows from a really intelligent use of the food system. Mm -hmm. So this great reset that I think Sarah alluded to, I think you're talking about Robert. Um, talk a little bit, Mark, because I think Mark, what Robert's getting at a little bit is like plugging both nonprofits, but also for-profit entrepreneurs into this ecosystem and totally. maybe doing a little bit more social good, a little bit more kind of collaboration than they've ever done before. And one of the things that struck me in the pre-call, we always have a pre-call for these sessions. Mark, you said there's money everywhere, which I think a lot of restaurant operators aren't feeling that right now, but you were alluding specifically to maybe plugging into this ecosystem a little bit. Can you talk about maybe some ways in which a restaurant operator can do that? Yeah, sure. And I, I mean, I'll zoom back out and just like, I want to double click on some of Robert's points because they're super important. But there's um, 700 to 750,000 restaurants in America uh, that employ between 12 and 15 million people documented. What do you think the rest of that looks like? How many undocumented workers? Have you ever gone into a restaurant and not seen an undocumented worker? You haven't. It's not real. Um, there's 2 million farms, right? Ranchers alone, there's almost 3 million. How about the people who are working those? These food systems make up such a large part of the economy, where is their stuff going? So the first move that I made as soon as this was happening was put a call out on socials to suppliers and said, you've been here for me, I'm here for you, I'm still producing, I'm actually ranking up my production. And so when I say producing, we have a commissary kitchen very much modeled after DC Central, which then became LA. And I spent time in DC Central almost 10 years ago, nine years ago, I think, um, and just fell in love with the staff and the people and the model. Unfortunately, Robert was uh, on the road, but just incredible. And so we're like, how can we do more of this? And what does that look like to take in waste food, but also purchase product from local purveyors and suppliers and put out super nutritious meals. So when I reached out to suppliers, I was like, we're in this together. We walk hand in hand as farmers, as fishermen, et cetera. What do you have that I can buy from you? Because we still have money. We don't have a lot of it, but as a nonprofit, we can buy stuff from you because we have to still buy it. And so that relationship just deepened. So as a restaurateur, right? I have a kitchen, I can produce food, I can still supply, what does that look like? And you have a couple of options. So some of the options that we've seen in restaurants that are working are a one-for-one -one model. Everybody loves to go to the one-for-one. -one. It makes our eyes roll sometime, but it's easily digestible and people know what's going on. So there's a guy in Palo Alto who's doing a one-for-one -one on his takeout meals. He starts it, he launches it, the first day he has 750 sales. That triples his income from usual income because the other one is going to frontline workers. People care, right? So what I always try to tap in with people is we've been doing design based around empathy and true human spirit forever. And people are like, nobody cares about folks who are homeless. And we introduce a product and people immediately flock to it because they do care. They just don't know how to get involved. So as restaurateurs, we have this incredible opportunity to work with the supply chain, to work with waste food, to support farmers, to support suppliers, to support our staff, to support the entire ecosystem and shed a light on what's possible. Because we do this already. Robert created most of this. Like we know how to do this. If this became normative behavior, which is what we've been trying to get to happen forever, this is our moment, right? So as a restaurateur to look into your direct community and supply and say, I'm not doing this for Instagram likes. I'm not doing this for a little bit of a media blitz. I'm going to do this forever. So we got together with our BC Women's and Children's Hospital and we're working on a, a triangle deal right now to start feeding as of Friday, every single first responder and ambulance driver. They were left sort of aside in this design process. It's like, let's get nurses and doctors fed, 100%. But everybody went that way because it was like the popular thing and it was trending. It's like, what about the other people in this ecosystem? So there's an opportunity to have that funded and to generate those meals in a really respectful way and help people be seen. So I say all this to say there's lots of opportunity out there to generate revenue and business while being super safe while supporting your community and then looking to your supply. Most people who start a restaurant don't know how to run a restaurant. First of all, they're not cooks. They're not, they haven't been in the business. They think they have the romantic notion that, that they'll hang out with their friends and charm beautiful women. And that's how the business works. And really, if you haven't been in it, you don't know how the supply chain works. And so to say to a first time restaurateur, you don't have to use the big guys. You can actually just reach out directly to farmers and probably save yourself a ridiculous amount of money there's that ecosystem um, that exists. So that's just another way to start supporting. And I also put my hand up, if there's restaurateurs who are tuned in here who are struggling with what to do, I'm available as a resource and so is my team. Like we wanna help people navigate this and um, destroy any of these false narratives and fear that they've got around it because we're all in this together at this moment. So if I can just riff for a second here, see somebody asking a question about 
<clears throat> you know, this sounds great, but uh, industrial food controls a lot of stuff. And they do. And I just wanted to really react to that because a lot of what Mark and I are both talking about is how do we take this moment and really integrate really bold new ideas about food systems? You know, again, um, here in New Mexico, for example, uh, before he became the uh, uh, mayor of Albuquerque, um, the gentleman, I, I can't remember his name right now. It's funny because they call him the Slayer mayor because he's such a heavy, uh, 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 heavy metal dude. But um, he did a, a report that showed that um, of $125 million in food contracts in the state, schools, all the different things, only 11% went to local businesses. And that really sent a ripple through the legislature because, again, what you have is such a baked in kind of mentality of, you know, low bid. And I think this is where in that construct, when no one really questioned that, this is where larger food service companies have dominated. So, again, a progressive legislator, whether it's based on what the L.A. Food Policy Council did years ago, created a good food purchasing act, which mm -hmm. mandates <clears throat> that a certain amount of, of uh, any budget over ten thousand dollars for food. And that's usually schools, meals on wheels, hospitals, prisons. They, they have to check boxes, buy local, pay a good wage, that kind of stuff. That needs to be mandated. Second, we probably need to look at the insidious nature of rebates, which is basically kickbacks. And this is how large food service companies really, to a certain extent, slide money under the table to often cash strapped local bureaucracies, in particular school food systems. I mean, school systems. Um, so again, it, it's, it's electing a generation of new legislators who understand the power of the food system. It's policy like Good Food Purchasing Act doing away with low bid and moving to best value, forbidding rebates. But these are the kind of this is the moment we must seize, because I think if we can show that the, the investment like this, like, man, that's part of my pitch to the folks in New Mexico here. You invest in your local farmers. Guess what? They only reinvest that money. Same with local restaurateurs like Mark's. These are people who, by their very nature, whether they're committed business people who pay a good wage, whether it's social entrepreneurs, whether it's local farmers, profit never leaves town. And if mm -hmm. I'm there of any town right now, that's that's music to my ears. And well, you've been the, you've been appointed, a, at least in New Mexico, you're kind of like working with the local government to help them figure out their food safety like, policy and, and helping to to figure out how to plug in some of these local businesses, some of the trade conventions. Uh, trade show conventions into the local food system. Talk a little bit about the work you're doing there. Well, actually, dude, I'm hoping what I do never happens because, you know, what we're looking <laughs> at is, is a really, um, it's really fucked up right now. I mean, I think I, I, there's no other way to put it, dudes. I apologize for people in the audience, but, you know, we're not looking at people who are ill. We're looking at people who were broke and, and millions yeah. and millions of people across this country who were, they were going to restaurants. They were having a good time. Life was good. You know, they were going to grocery stores where cheap, where food was plentiful. Um, you know, they were just participating in life and suddenly they're unemployed like that. So one of the things we're having to look at besides buttressing what's already here, man. And again, props, I, I, I must admit, I've, I've had my, my differences with our brothers and sisters in food banking, but they are fucking they're out there, out there making it happen. Hard work. I mean, they are. And, and again, as their volunteer pool shrinks, because either they were elder or they're afraid. I mean, these are people who are just 24 seven right now. But what I'm looking at in my, my clarion call to every single mayor and governor is grab your convention center right now. Convention centers are the hubs because what you're seeing and you hear it every day in the news about the Javits Center in New York, um, that the, uh, the convention center in LA, but you never hear them talking about the kitchens below. The, some of the best industrial kitchens in any single town are gonna be below the convention center. And not only that, but because these things have been canceled and they're empty, do they, they automatically make perfect triages for hospitals. They could be additional storage for food banks. But I tell you, man, those kitchens uh, and more importantly, the kitchen staff at these um, uh, that are used to producing 10, 20, 30,000 meals a day in a big convention center, those men and women, I'm hoping they get enlisted really quick because what I'm, I'm proposing is, again, is that we start to really wash all of this produce that's coming in that again, you pick it, you pluck it, it's going bad. It needs to be stabilized quick. Um, but you bring in an army of culinary professionals, and even to the point where you consider sequestering them uh, in, a, in a safe part of the convention center where they can work in you know three shifts, 24 hours a day production. Because I think what you're seeing now is a, is a reliance throughout our system on food boxes of food that are shelf stable so people can cook at home. 
What I'm planning for, and I think we all need to plan around, is two weeks, four weeks, six weeks out. How do we feed the the millions of people who may be poor uh, and uh, and out of gas in their cars? You know, wh what are the new distribution hubs? Yeah, I love that um, planning and looking into the future a little bit more. I mean, we got to think beyond just like what the reality is today and think about it in two months, three months. And that's one of the things you've been thinking a lot about, Robert. We have a question I want to actually ask in the in the questions. Um, and it applies specifically to this, this inner kind of play between the private sector, I think, and the government. It says, in the media, what are the steps to make government food procurement a reality? What are the physical, what are the logical steps? How do we make sure the food gets to our most vulnerable populations? Either one of you guys want to take that. Go for it. I'm going to jump if, Robert, you want to, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So we yeah. already work with our government and have done so for eight years. Uh, we work with our provincial government that then works through another nonprofit partner that funds them for food procurement. And then we uh, answer an RFP, very, very governmental, and have won that RFP years after years after years because we provide the best quality food for the not lowest cost. It's not a race to the bottom. I, we refuse to participate in those. It's like, this is what it costs. I can then do joint fundraising. So you're looking at multi-tiered partnerships, right? Um, much like Robert, I was the first guy when I started, I came out and I was like, government's messing this up. Citizens aren't doing enough. Businesses are screwed, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was like, wait, oh, okay. Now I don't have any friends left is what I played. <laughs> um, and so I had to look back and be like, okay, what is this? What, you know, people are just people. If we can give them the proper tools that they then respond to well, and we can work with them versus saying, you have to meet us where we are. Uh, there's an opportunity to get people fed and us to the tune of 2.6 million as of last week. That's in partnership with government. Now, I don't deal with them directly. I deal with a nonprofit partner that I love, uh, and they produce the RFP, a request for purchase. And we then respond to that in a way of this is what we can provide. And the, some of the data and the metrics that you use when working with government are really, really important. And it's like, if we get people fed, what do the stats look like? So we work with single room occupancy hotels, uh, transitional housing for people coming out of street entrenchment. We feed 13 of those hotels a day. In those hotels, all the stats around violence and 911 calls plummet as soon as you get people fed. They plummet. So what's the cost on a 911 call? What's the cost on an emergency service call? And so we start to look at that stuff and say, quality of life improves, our number one thing. You can imagine going to a meeting hungry. What does it look like trying to find upward mobility or find your way out of addiction or instability without a full stomach? It's, impos it's impossible. So we wanna provide that, that's our focus. But outside, we also take into account what everybody else needs for their mandates. And we play the game with them. It's like, this is what you need to understand. And this is how many people we employ who are coming out of it. So over 60% of our staff come from recidivism. So they've been in jail multiple times, street entrenchment. They have a mental or physical diverse ability. We don't say the word disability because that's bullshit. They just have a, they're differently abled. And that's what our core staff makes up of. Government loves that. They love that because they realize that that's not a burden on the system further, that we're actually using society in a really meaningful way that helps keep people out of that. So what are all of the things that we can address with the food system that help people while getting them fed? That's what we're trying to design. So the government definitely plays a role. They just don't know what it is. This is they're not trained in that. That's not their world. So to go to them and say, hey, we can do A, B, C, D, E. Here's the model. It's proven. Now can you give us some money is counterintuitive to my nature. Um, but it also is, it's inclusionary and it, it helps us figure things out. So I've, I've been against uh, many government policies, almost all of them, but also understand that they do want to help in some instances in creating and procuring food that makes sense. So I believe in everything that Robert's saying and um, I'm happy to share all the documents I have so you can go kick some ass or more ass, I should say. By the way, I, I think that's one of the things that Mark and I are both very open source. You know, we're we're 100 willing to share anything we have. Um, just so you know, right now I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm working in a lot of different places, and I think a lot of people are making this up as they go. I certainly am. But here's basically what I'm in the middle of right now: is saying, I know I'm going to have to get government to spend money they probably don't have, and I have to make a smart pitch. And to Mark's point, how do we leverage all the different assets of the community so they say, okay, I see where you're going with this, and how you're going to be able to get some good data for me. Um, but at the same time, I, ba I basically divided this into three pools. There's the aggregate, there's the production, there's the distribution. So I have a team of people now working on aggregation, basically going out to the local farm community and saying, okay, how much do you have? And I think across the board, 
the, the word of the day is both it's shape shift and break even. If I'm a restaurateur, I'm a home farmer, just make me make me break even. That's all. No profit right now. So again, who's got food? How can you how much do you have? So I can tell how much storage space we're going to need because there's inevitably going to be the need to rent refrigerated trucks. You know, no matter how big a city you want, I mean, you're looking at large scale refrigeration for both stuff coming in, but also the processed meals. Then we're looking at the convention center and the, the, the restaurant community and the hotel community. Who are the chefs available? Food trucks, refrigerated trucks. So we can start to look at all the different ways we can incorporate what's already here really efficiently. And then third is distribution. And how do we get this food out beyond the traditional means? And I may have mentioned earlier, but we're looking at fire stations also, because to Mark's point, for addicts, firehouses are safe. You know, fire fire people are so you have the ability to potentially layer not only food distribution um, for packaged foods, but also fresh foods, but also maybe some health screening on top of that. When I put all those strings together, now I have a budget, and I can go to the city and give them what is going to be a tough number. But at the same time, I can also go to the philanthropic community and say, look, let's do business here. You've got a thousand nonprofits and I'm not trying to cut anybody out, but I've asked them what they need to go to scale. Uh, and I, I put that together. And what I've got now is a way for government and philanthropy to match each other and get kind of a super fund that can be that can manage, again, support local farmers, keep people employed, make sure get people get decent meals. And then I can give you the outcomes. So at the end of the day, you can say we had to spend money, but here's the results we got. I'm making it up as I go, dudes, but I'm happy to share whatever I have. So one of the things that people were asking, and I, I knew that they would, and I just want to jump in here. They want to know how to get a hold of you guys. Mark, you put your website in there. Robert, you have a, a couple websites. Let's just get it in the middle of the video. Well, how do people get the easiest one is is um, R L E E G G E R at um, gmail.com. I, I, I'll type it over in the corner here in a second. Yeah, I mean, we'll have it. We'll make sure anyone wants to get a hold of you, get some of that open source concepts also, that you guys are working on. Also, look to Wage Coalition, look to World Central Kitchen. There's a lot of really good models out there. One of the things um, that we talked about before, Robert, is like how these restaurants may have to shift permanently or at least over the next year to adapt, whether they're uh, a, just a, a shared kitchen or if they're like a for-profit restaurant. And one of the things you talked about is like the menu. Let's get specific on that. Cause I think restaurant tours are thinking about, okay, what do I do to survive? Obviously people are thinking about like, okay, do I, do I adapt it for like a delivery model? But you had some more, some specific ideas. Like we may need to completely rethink the menu in these times. Can you talk a little bit about that? If you're a, if you're a restaurant tour or trying to feed people who may not have as much money, what are you thinking? Well, again, it's kind of a bitter pill because I think many people in our industry have worked hard tirelessly to build a craft and, a, and an art. Uh, and you know they 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 love putting out beautiful meals. And in fact, it, I, I know your uh, audience is international, but I think the American um, the groaning plate that is the benchmark of the American food system. You know we're used to big big servings, uh, and I think what you need to look at. And I've seen not just here but around the country, many restaurants are trying to either say I'll do carry out of my traditional model or can I get the public to subsidize what I do so I can deliver meals to first responders? Another big, big kind of shift. I'm just suggesting that when we come out of this and people are gonna start going back to work again and they'll earn it, but it's gonna take a lot for people to catch up. And I think there's a lot of money to be made in a very modest menu. I mean, I think the idea of trimming things down and creating very, very affordable meals for people. And in fact, I'll be honest with you, this is uh, probably the biggest transition that I've been working on for years, um, I've focused a lot on seniors because every single day in, in the United States and frankly, all over the world, tens of thousands of people turn 70 every single day. This is unprecedented. And there's no real plan for how we're gonna feed this many elders. And for many of us in this industry, particularly institutional food, <clears throat> we are defined by the four compartment tray, You know, where the big piece of meat goes here and then the vegetable, the starch and whatever else. And I think the tyranny of the plate is something we need to reject. So when I was at LA Kitchen, and a lot of what I'm looking at here is kind of what you're seeing, whether it's sweet greens, tender greens, some of these new models that are creating kind of a very healthy bowl. In other words, where it's layered and it all is integrated. So instead of a divided meal, you get it integrated. I think th there's real power in the three to five dollar, three to six dollar bowl that you can produce for people that is good, solid sustenance that allows you to, again, purchase local, but it's definitely plant forward. It's not vegetarian or vegan, even though I applaud both, but it's plant forward, which 
again, puts in a, a much smaller amount of animal protein, starts to really experiment with alternate proteins, but gives people a robust, flavorful um, replacement for what has, again, been called the standard American diet or the SAD diet. <laughs> Hey, Mark, I think you responded to Nindini in the comments, but she wanted to talk about implementing operations while we're kind of in this world of social distancing and quite honestly, thinking about the safety of our staff. I mean, some of the chefs in New York and some of the chefs across the country here have closed down, not because they don't think they can make money with deliveries, because they're worried about their staff getting sick. So can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we had uh, all of our staff three weeks ago sign a full agreement to say that they would socially isolate. And so uh, Nadine is asking about is people who don't have stable housing. Now, Nadine, for oh. clarity, we don't work with people without stable housing. We help them find stable housing first uh, and help them get all the supports that they need, if that's the case, to ensure that they have a roof over their head, a place to shower, a place to like be ready. <clears throat> so we're not getting ready for workforce. We're like, we'll help you be in the workforce. And so that's not really our role. With our staff, we had them read uh, an entire two pager and then sign it in front of our management that said, you know, this isn't like go and hang out with your friends on the weekend time anymore. If you're going to continue to work in this kitchen, you have to self isolate on your way to and fro. These are the transport regulations and how you're going to get to and fro. We will help subsidize all of that. Like whatever that needs to be, we're paying for parking for folks who wouldn't normally drive down and just make sure that you're able to keep this container really, really sanitary. And then it's uh, as a chef, it's an opportunity to get people to really tighten up on their cleanliness, right? All the stuff we already do. When people are like, hey, are you guys like, what, is, what about sanitary? I'm like, we keep you from getting sick. That's our job. Like, it's our job all the time. So we definitely know how to not cross contaminate. We definitely know how to keep surfaces spotless at all times. And my kitchen essentially looks like a hospital anyway. Uh, so we've got people really up on their game. And the people we work with really care. You don't come and work on a meal program for residents of one of the most marginalized neighborhoods on the planet if you don't care already. So it's easy to motivate folks and staff to make sure that they feel safe. Also, they're looking to you for direction. How do I stay safe? Right. So that's our job as leaders is to make sure that people are and that we continue to update them with information constantly. As we're in this conversation, there's a WhatsApp channel that's exploding that I'm ignoring right now that is up to date information for our entire teams to make sure that everybody feels really, really safe. But I wanted to loop back to, and I hope that answers your question, Nadini. I wanted to loop back to Robert <clears throat> because I think we share an ethos around the restaurant's role, right? So when he's talking about the uh, progression into fast casual, which has happened, we have the opportunity as culture leaders, right? We are, we lead the culture around what happens next. When cocktail culture was emergent, we were in it. Like when it was like, oh, we don't just drink Cosmos anymore. Like, no, we actually eat food with our cocktails. And this is what that looks like. People come along for the ride because they look to us. Unfortunately, the chains and the way people have gone is that we're reactionary to what we believe a consumer wants versus helping the consumer go there. Right. So when we say to a consumer, we're a slow food restaurant, we started eight or nine years ago saying that people are like, what is that? What do we eat slower? Like, no, close. But what it means is that the system is being respected and that we pay a premium for certain things. And then we translate that to the plate and the plate isn't overflowing. Here's five or six small items and they're going to cost you 15 to $18, not 35. And you should order five or six of them. When it went to a top of scenario, that was a trend that kicked and restaurateurs were stoked. We we're like, oh my God, we can serve real portions for a moment. But if you continue to feed the beast, which is literal obesity and diabetes, you're already part of the problem. Why are you opening a restaurant to kill people? Like, what is it that you want to provide to the world? And you have an opportunity as a community restaurant to help guide people along. It's a communication deal. It's investing in your clientele as people, as humans. And that's why in our 13 different restaurants that I've opened, the only way we've ever closed is because we felt it was time to move on. And that's three to 5% make it past five years. This, these models aren't a maybe. This is like what it means to be part of a restaurateur community and to help guide things. So we're now in a moment to say, what does the restaurant do? When somebody comes in and says, I want chicken, we're like, we don't serve chicken right now. But what we do have is this. And then you have a, an interaction versus a, I don't go there because. And so I think restaurateurs live in fear and have for a very long time that the system will reject what it is that they put forward. But it is really about being truly authentic in what you do. And then people will come for that. They, they understand it. They believe it. 
And if we were to all rhyme off our favorite restaurants, I think you'll think you'll see that they sort of fall into those buckets. We were provided comfort with expertise. You know, one thing to riff on, though, is I think we're going to see a, a renaissance of street food. I mean, you know, again, for many restaurants, I mean, the idea of street food was something and we, we you know, we upped the price on it. But the idea of taking it back down to the street level um, is something I'm fascinated by. Um, you know, one of the things that Mark and I have historically shared, he from for profit, me from nonprofit, is a commitment to a living wage and benefits for our employees. And I think that's also something that as the industry re-explores, whether it's the wage that is historically paid um, and the relationship to that and the price of food, but also the mental health. Uh, I think, you know, last year, um, I still can't watch No Reservations. I don't know about you or anybody else, but I can't see Anthony's face um, or hear his voice. But, um, you know, he brought up the the issue of mental health within our industry and, and addiction within our industry. So there's a lot of ways in which we can have kind of a moment of clarity for our, for our industry, you know, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, you know, how do we make sure that the food we're putting out is healthy and affordable uh, in, in reasonable portions? How do we support local growers? How do we make sure that we're not putting an enormous strain on our staff? Uh, and how can we get, again, a really decent meal out to as many people as possible? All really good things. With Anthony, I'm going to finish with him on my closing today. Um, he's an amazing guy. Yeah. Mental health is a big focus of what we do, yeah. too. Yeah, a little kind of tip for you guys if you're if you're digging what Mark has to say. I asked Mark to actually help us close out today, so you're kind of going a little bit solo. We'll do a little bit of conversation at the end. Um, you talked about this Clarion call, Robert, um, and it kind of tying together with what 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 Mark said. This idea of like as chefs and kind of restaurateurs living your values and kind of and and leading through values. And it sounds like maybe we're we're having a Clarion call moment as we move towards this this reset that Sarah talked a little bit about, like setting a new template you know we had we you know 20 years over the last 20 years we had the kind of this celebrity chef in the in the us is about like uh with the four corner the the four corners of meals lots of protein but i think that we're going to live through new values and maybe this is an opportunity to kind of uh so how would you guys who are used to doing this kind of sh demonstrating and showing people how to lead and live through values and food how would someone who maybe is just running a corner teriyaki place or whatever, how do, what would you say to them? How do they do that? How do they kind of show values and maybe uh, in a way that they're comfortable with? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Robert, yeah. did you want to start? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I tell you, man, there's, there's no better people than hospitality people. I mean, I've been in service my entire career. You're, I mean, a, you know, when I first started the DC kitchen uh, and I proposed this idea of training men and women out of prison or addicts, of the homeless for food service careers, you know, again, well-meaning people really kind of laughed and said, you're naive to think restaurants will hire, you know, addicts. And again, I think all of us in the industry laughed. It's like, dudes, you know, kitchens are the island of misfit toys. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's never more, more, there's, there's no more accepting uh, and, and welcoming group than the back of the house uh, of kitchens. I mean, you know, servers, bartenders, um, these are people who love what they do, man. They love what they do. Um, I think that to a certain extent, there, there's this, been this trap, this system in which, again, you have an, an unreal expectation, at least in the United States, of the value of food, where people think mm. cheap, cheap equals good, a lot mm. equals good. And I think we have this moment. I think you're going to see people. Um, you know, one of the, and it's a little sidebar here, but one of the things we're going to have to help Americans through is there is a very good likelihood, and you're seeing it already from the national level, of, of, of where don't go to the grocery store. And even if you do go to the grocery store, there's going to be a likelihood that there won't be as much as you're used to. And so for many Americans who've been really spoiled globally, um, they're going to have to learn how to stretch food at home. And I think many chefs could be a tremendous help, uh, whether it's in your own videos, your own thing, but helping people understand how do you stretch what you have. But I think we have this moment where we may introduce a great sense of respect for food again, you know, uh, that sense of you see it all the time. It's like, oh, my God, what restaurant are you going to go to when this ends? People are anxious to get back out. And when they come out, we can say, look at what we all just went through. You know, we've redesigned our restaurant here. We really want to focus on some things that we now know are more important to us. We want to source our food locally. We want to make sure our workers are well paid. We want to put together a healthy meal that might not be as giant as you're used to. I think there's a moment of, of, of both clarity, both on the producer side, but also on the consumer side that I think 
I think there's going to be an army of food service professionals who are really going to be open to exploring a new way to serve our communities great meals, but in a way that enlightens them through the process of what we serve, not just fills them up. Correct. Chris, or uh, I mean, uh, Mark. Yeah, I can get I, that. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll call you Chris. Can I call you Chris? Um, you can call me whatever you like, Michael. You know, we talked about how you were working with uh, a chef, uh, a friend of yours who's a cook, who's basically doing, you're helping her do some online cooking classes. So there's been some chefs in my community, Eric Rivera for one, who's basically taking his virtual, he usually invites people into his kitchen and teaches them how to food in his, how to cook in his restaurant, but he's taking that online. I, I'm riffing on that because Robert mentioned that, like, Maybe that's another way we can instill values is just using the more modern communication tools. And we're seeing it already. We're seeing people cooking online. Talk a little bit about what you're, what you're doing. Yeah. And I want to just answer Chris, if I can, too, because I think it's a really important question, which is like how an operator can be more lean and efficient in order to gain better margins. Yeah. Yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. That's like that's super critical specifically to this conversation. Um, and then a short one around making food stretch to Robert's point and what you're asking right now. Uh, on Insta, I've got five or six things that are like, this is how you make bone broth, this is how you make ramen, this is how you yeah, make yeah. all the stuff that you're craving, and it's free. And this is how you support your local markets, which you can go to safely and, and get stuff from that you should be going to anyway. It's a great time for you to explore your Chinatown. Go to Chinatown, go to Chinatown. I can't say it enough. Like, go and support those markets. Produce is really inexpensive and is coming from local spots. So, um, wonderful. And then how we make more money. So our businesses are only viable because of, not in spite of, our hiring practices. It's super important differentiation. Because we hire people who come from diversely abled backgrounds, we make more money. And why? Turnover. The single biggest crippling thing in a restaurant is turn and burn of staff, right? So you have 80% per annum nationally across North America that turn over every year. Now, the median cost to train an employee in the U.S. is quoted at $5,000 U.S. We say it's about $3,000 in our metric for about 15 years in the business here. But regardless, that's that. If you're a small to medium-sized business, do the math. If you're burning 30% or 30 people on a 40-person 40, 40 staff, that's, it's crazy. That's 150 grand. So stability of staff is where those margins get better. So if you've got people who are willing to show up who are just like about their job, who are not looking to be the chef, who are not looking to go open their own spot, who are not reading for a part on TV next week. Those people are really critical to the backbone of your operation, your stability, and how you make money. Again, because of, not in spite of. So I know that people have a lot of nerves hiring folks who have diversely abled backgrounds or coming out of marginalized situations. There is a moment that that's a false narrative we tell ourselves, first of all, that there's a lack of trust, et cetera. And back to Robert's point, they're already there. <laughs> They've been being in kitchens. They like if you survey your staff and you're like, if this isn't a cone of silence, does anybody struggle with mental illness? Well, if 30% of the population, the chances are pretty damn good that you're already dealing with somebody that has mental health issues. So by daylighting that stuff, you also retain people, you make them feel safe, you make them feel included. So this is the backbone of how your food quality is, how your staff morale is, what the feeling in your restaurant is and why people come to you, you can always point out the guy who like bust your table for 30 years at the diner, who had this really quirky way about him. That was the way that he socialized and came out. That's part, really important. So money, when I say that with people, they're like, so wait a sec, aren't those two things separate? Like you're doing good for the community, money is over here. Like, no, they're intrinsic. They have to be intrinsic. That's good design and that's just good sense is to have people coming through. That's the way that I would lean on the most. And then the second one we already talked about, Chris, which is working with your suppliers and adapting your menu in real time to be able to use ingredients that they have a surplus of or that they're you know, really trying to push through. And then you start to understand the locality, the growing seasons and what that looks like. And you build your menu off of that, right? See people like, I want avocado toast. I'm like, cool, we don't grow avocados. So you can't have avocado toast here and it would be $27. And also that's bullshit and you don't want that. Let me make you something else that's really delicious and you steer them away from that. If you want avocado toast, have that in California. It's wonderful there. It's delicious in Mexico City. You should have those things there <laughs> if you travel. But if you're spending $7 for an avocado and wondering where your money's gone as a restaurateur, you can figure it out pretty quick. Um, so I hope that's helpful. You know, one thing real quick, if I can jump is, 
you know, I've worked with a lot of groups and, and particularly in the kind of, um, again, I mentioned sweet greens, tender greens, these kind of new salad. It's just, but so many restaurants really look down at uh, 40 and below as their customer base. And I tell anybody who listens, it's like, dudes, and I urge all of you, well, there is gold in old. I mean, you know, if you're really looking at people, kind of the, the new, the young old, 50 to 70, which you've got is probably the most health conscious, one of the most health conscious generations before COVID. And I think what you're going to see after this is a huge audience that's going to be much, much more health conscious, much more aware of the role food plays in their immunity system. So again, we have the potential to sell people smaller portions, locally sourced, healthier product, less animal protein, good wage, all baked into one beautiful new menu. I want to respect the time. We have about four or five more minutes. There is one question here on the sidebar I want to ask you, and maybe if you could take a stab at it. It's kind of riffs on what you just said, Robert. Um, this post-COVID world, we're all going to be thinking a little bit more about things in certain aspects. Uh, Federica asks, what about food safety? Do you think that it'll be stricter after the pandemic? And how will this affect restaurant markets? Mark? You want me to answer that? Well, you're going to finish. I'll, I'll, I'll riff on this and you can finish. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, Mark said it earlier, man. Restaurants, man, we're we're highly regulated. I mean, it, nonprofit, yeah. for-profit, health departments, knock, knock on, on the door, man. They're all the time. And I don't think any good restaurateur isn't hyper about this. But yeah, you know, um, I do worry that there's going to be such a rush to get back and open uh, that there may be some some corners cut. Um, but that being said, I think I think food safety still is is such a huge priority in our industry, always has been. But I think what you're going to see is, thankfully for all of us, man, people are going to get used to washing their hands on a real regular basis. I mean, that's probably one of the best things that come out of this, man, is people just getting <laughs> used to washing their hands on a regular basis. So anyway, I'm going to let Mark finish. It's been an honor to hang with you all. Um, you know, rock and roll, reach out if you need me. You're the best, Robert. Uh, I'm just going to double click exactly what you said. So we're under incredible regulation already. In my commissary kitchen, we have uh, five hand sinks in 1,100 square feet. Five, right? Like there's and then there's a separate mop sink, and then there's a double sink, and then there's like health and regulation around North America is. I mean, it's like trying to get your your acing your exam, right? Because it goes in the window. If people come by and they see a C, they're not eating there, right? It's just not a thing. So, you know, you as a restaurateur are striving consistently to make sure that you get high marks in that realm, not just because of the health board, but because of you, you want the sanctity of your own food. One bad Yelp review of somebody getting sick is a couple thousand clients out the door. Like you can't have it, right, as an operator. And more importantly, we just care about people too much to allow them to get ill in our spot. So I think there's a, a strict, strict amount of, of regulation around there for a reason. So restaurateurs who before were kind of like, ah, oh, that's the health board being overcautious. Hopefully it'll snap them all in the line, like Robert said. Well, this has been great, man. I wish Robert didn't jump off so soon, but like, thank you, Robert. If you're watching still, he actually put his email in the sidebar there if people want to get a hold of him. Uh, because both you guys are open source uh, thinkers and operators. Uh, I'm sure you want people to kind of be in touch with you. So feel free to do that, folks. Uh, this session will be available like actually later today through Crowdcast. I think people are already asking about it. They probably want to go over some of the points. Mark, we're going to see you again at the end of the day. Yes, sir. And, and you're going to give a little bit of an inspiring message. Folks, uh, this is. Uh, the next session starts at 11 in about 10 minutes, and that'll be Ryan Palmer, who's a, an expert. He runs the law practice for Lothrop, uh, a law firm, and he basically can have some very practical tips on what you should do from a legal perspective and also how to maybe access some of this government money out there. So, hey, Mark, thanks a lot, man. We'll talk to you soon. Pleasure. Have a great right, day, guys. everybody. Bye, everyone. We'll see you in a bit.